So we all know Steve Jobs, Sheryl Sandberg, Daniel Ek from Spotify. We all know how successful they are. We've heard about the amazing organizations that they've built, amazing products that they've built. All the stories that we know are like endless success, right? Like a swan gliding through the water elegantly and success all over the place. What we know a lot less about, like Stefan just said, is the blood, sweat and tears involved in building all those great products and building those great organizations. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about today. The frustrating side of developing products. To give you an example, a few years ago, I found myself in a room with a number of engineers in my team. And it turned out that a feature that I thought we'd committed to and built hadn't been done. So when I probed and asked them, like, why did we not build this? What happened? This is what they said. Well, Mark, the business analyst wasn't here. We didn't have any user stories. And Mark, you know how it works, right? No user stories, we're not gonna build the feature. And I lost it, right? I lost it. I shouted, I screamed, I got offensive, I left the room in a huff, right? Obviously, I calmed down afterwards, apologized to the team, but it did make me reflect on why I behaved in that kind of way. I would never justify it, I'm not proud of it, but it did make me think about the frustrations involved in developing products. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk a bit more about why I believe there's such a close link to product development and frustrations. I'm gonna talk a bit more about my personal frustrations. Don't worry, it's not gonna be like a psychotherapy session, right? But I will share some of my learnings and some of my insights, but more importantly, give you some tools and techniques that I personally find helpful in managing those frustrations. Comes with a word of warning though, because I don't proclaim to have all the answers. It's not like this is a self-help self session. I'm gonna give you all the answers. For all I know, some of the frustrations and tensions that I'll be talking about today might not even apply to you, but hopefully you'll be able to pick and mix maybe recognize a few things that feel familiar and pick out some of the tools and techniques that we'll be talking about today and be able to apply those to your day jobs. So the two main reasons why I believe that there's such a close link to frustrations and developing products are the very nature of product development, and I'll break that down for you in a minute, but also the fact that when we're developing or managing products, we're managing people. So first, the very nature of product development. There's five elements there, which all in their own right, I would argue, can cause a lot of frustration. And you know, I hope that some of you will nod or shake their heads as you see something that feels familiar. So first of all, dealing with stakeholders. I often feel like when I'm in a room, you know, it's like staring into the abyss when you're dealing with stakeholders. But equally, especially because I work as part of cross-functional teams, some of our meetings are not always a pretty sight either, right? Because we've got arguments, we've got conflict. Because the good thing is that cognitive diversity brings together a lot of different backgrounds, different perspectives, which is awesome. What we talk a lot less about is some of the downsides of having a cognitive diverse team, where you get lots of opinions, lots of beliefs, lots of different approaches, and the net result of that kind of cognitive diversity is a lot of noise, right? So that's the first aspect of the very nature of developing products, which can cause a lot of frustration. Secondly, this idea that, you know, you follow a number of set steps or a magic formula, and you have an amazing successful product. Well, let me tell you something. There is no blueprint for developing successful products. Anyone who tells you that you just have to follow a set menu or a number of steps is talking absolute nonsense, right? But that can cause a lot of frustration in its own right. And when I used to be a digital project manager before I became a product person, I loved creating these lovely Gantt charts. You know, because every time I created a Gantt chart like this, a project plan, the world felt like a better place to me because I mapped all the dependencies, everything would happen on schedule, within time, budget, the risk will all be planned for, right? 
But I learned very quickly, and I learned the hard way, that product development doesn't work like that. It never, ever goes to plan, right? One of the reasons why that is the case is that we're being creative. We're doing things that I haven't done before, even whether you're starting from scratch, working on a completely new product or feature, or you're iterating on an existing product or feature, we're coming up with new solutions that haven't been done before. So the reality is that developing products is a lot messier than my tidy GAN charts. Finally, again, when we talk about the nature of developing products, coming up with compromises and making tough trade-off decisions is part and parcel of what we do as product managers, as designers, as engineers. We're constantly looking for something that has to give, where we have to make sacrifices, where we have to compromise. And that can be tough in its own right, right? You, I'm sure you've all seen this iron triangle where you constantly have to navigate between scope, schedule, and resources. And like I said, at some point, one of these three, three things will have to give. So, in summary, that very nature of developing products, whether it's dealing with stakeholders, whether it's not having a, a blueprint for product development, things, accepting that things will never go to plan, or having to make those tough trade-off decisions, that can cause a lot of frustration. Now, the second reason that I believe there's such a close correlation between frustration and product development is all about people. The irony is that I thought, you know, if I become a product manager, I never have to deal with people ever again. The reality is I probably, especially because I'm part of cross-functional teams, spend 90% of my time dealing with people, right? And they all come with their own perspectives. I'm in the mix, I have my own desires. You work with an engineer, they've got their needs, got designers. So again, this in its own right, and we'll talk about that a bit more, can cause a lot of frustration, right? And to be able to handle all those different personalities and different needs, I encourage you to look at yourself first um, before you effectively can handle the other people that you work with. Now, handle is not the right word, but working effectively with other people in your team. So for instance, really understanding your own emotional triggers. What are specific words, phrases, or situations that trigger you, that set off emotions that you're not sure about, like anxiety or sadness or fear? Because I do strongly believe that only if you know those things about yourself and understand what triggers you and what emotions come out as a result, you'll be able to work more effectively with other people. Because if you don't, you're the one who's left feeling like the old one out, right? Because you haven't made that connection with how other people might be feeling, right? So again, that second main area for frustration when it comes to developing product is all to do with people. And it's about you know, managing yourself first, understanding other people before you can start building relationships. Because especially if you work in a cross-functional team, building those relationships with other members in your team and outside of it, building that trust is absolutely crucial. So this is the point, now that we've understood a bit more about the link between product development and frustrations, like I said, I want to tell you about some of my frustrations, and they're here on this slide. First, I'd like to talk to you about the things that make me angry, right? When I miss a sense of urgency, when I'm in a team and I feel we're not on the same page, we're not aligned, right? Feel that we're not delivering value to the customer or I feel misunderstood or I also feel like people are not meeting my quote unquote standards, right? Those are the things that can really make me feel angry. And the problem with that very first frustration was that I only used to know one mode of conflict, and I can tell you it wasn't a pretty one, right? I would get very direct, you know, I'm from the Netherlands, so very direct, in your face, shouty, be very personal when I, whenever being in conflict, right? And I had to learn the hard way, and that's the first technique that I want to share with you today, which is all about managing conflict. One thing I found really helpful is to understand where I personally and the people that I work with sit on this conflict continuum, right? Because it's fair to say that I used to be on the right-hand side of it uh, where it says personal attacks, very personal, in your face. As we've seen with that example from a few years ago, that's not sustainable. Equally, people who are on 
you know, the kind of left-hand side where it says artificial harmony, where you, in a meeting with them or in a conversation, you think everything is okay. The moment you lift your heels, they bitch about you or say how it's all screwed. Also not great. Where you want to be when it comes to conflict is right in the middle. And you have that situation of what they call constru uh, constructive conflict. Because you aligned around the goal that you want to achieve. That is without question. And you found a constructive way of having debates and challenges about that shared goal, but not getting personal. And it's really helpful to understand where you personally fit on that scale, as well as the people that you interact with on a regular basis. And do that in combination with these kind of six C's from our friend Julia Whitney, where <clears throat> the first one is really to have a contract around conflict. And that's nothing more than just an agreed set of behaviors within your cross-functional team, for instance, where you say, if we ever get into a tense situation, we agree right here, right now, that we're never going to get personal, for instance, or we're not going to slam doors, whatever it is, but you've got an agreement. Because then it, when there is a sense of conflict or tension, it's much easier to call it, to say, hmm, I can feel something is bubbling up here. And then you can start canvassing views, you get people's opinions from the group, from the room. You can start looking at, right, what is, what is the... What is a good way out here? What are the options to resolving this conflict? And whatever you do, make sure you close the conflict, right? That might be a situation of agree to disagree, or as some people call it, disagree and commit. But at least you want to make sure that you're not le leaving that sense of conflict, that sense of tension simmering, basically. You really want to make sure there's an end point. And when it comes to the actual resolution to the conflict, there's different modes that you can take. Right? I don't know if you've seen this before, but I used to be very much in a kind of compete section, top left-hand quadrant of this diagram, right? Where everything was a battle and everything was a fight. Now, I'm not saying that you should never be in that compete field, because there might be things where you feel so strongly about them that you think it's worth you standing up for them and really trying to make a point. Equally, there'll be things where you think, this is not worth it, right? I'm going to accommodate instead because I'm picking my battles, I'm giving in here. Or there might be a top right-hand corner where it talks about collaboration, where you actually look as a group trying to dig into the issue and trying to come up with a win-win situation, right? But you can hopefully see that you've got options here when it comes to managing conflict. Now, this second technique that I want to talk about, again, related to that emotion of anger, especially when you're in the moment, is taking a helicopter view. It's really helpful, I find, to just almost detach yourself from the situation and step into that kind of helicopter almost and say, what is happening here, right? What's the situation? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to other people involved in this situation? How would other people look at this? What would a wise person say about this situation? And again, just that step of taking that helicopter view, almost like stepping onto a balcony, really helps to step out of the moment and let that anger subside. So when we talk about managing your anger, that first emotion and that first frustration when dealing with developing products, I'm talking about your conflict profile, those six C's that you can apply to deal with tough situations and stepping into that helicopter. Second emotion is sadness. I used to feel and sometimes still feel sad when developing products. And it's particularly when I feel as a product manager, even within my cross-functional team, when I feel lonely or I feel like we're not making progress or there's lots of conflicts and arguments in, in the group, those things can make me feel sad. Now, the problem was that I thought, well, how do I, what do I do with this sadness, right? Is it just... Do I have to accept it? And then does accepting mean I just give up and don't care anymore? And I found, found the alternative, which is about radical acceptance. Now, I misunderstood radical acceptance at first because I thought, well, that means you can get very emotional and let it all go because you're accepting that you're feeling sad. Now, clearly, if you want to be emotional and all the rest of it, I'm not going to stop you. But radical acceptance is really about accepting things for what they are. What that helps you to do is really pick your battles, because you take that view of, okay, this is something I can't influence, or you might not even want to influence, um, and focus on the things that you can influence and where you can make a difference. 
Um, but it's really useful to say, okay, this is something that's outside of my power, or it's not important enough, or it's never going to change. These things are actually things that I can make a difference, right? So sadness, really think about taking that step back, picking your battles, and also reflecting on those battles and think about what can I do differently or how can I improve things going forward. Feeling like a fraud. Who doesn't feel like an imposter when they develop products? Who doesn't? Interesting, just a few pins of hands basically. I feel like a fraud a lot of the time, right? Because I'm in a position where I don't know all the answers. Um, I'm working with people who are way smarter than me. You know, I work with engineers, designers, QAs. They're all experts in their own respective domains, and that can be quite daunting. That's the problem with, you know, feeling like a fraud, feeling like an imposter. It can really, apart from weakening your own self-perception, it also weakens the value that you can add to the process, to the team, to the product that you're building. So what I've learned and what I would like to share with you today is around silencing your inner fraud. So that inner feeling of being an imposter, how can you silence that or manage that a little bit better? And I know um, your English is 100% perfect, but still these bits I have to do in, in, in the local language, so I have to do in German, so bear with me because I really want this to resonate, really key. Warum? is really, really key if you want to silence that inner fraud, right? Because it's okay to not know all the answers. It's okay to just ask why, just explain it to me. Particularly if you're a product person, you work in a cross-functional team surrounded by all these kind of domain experts, it is okay, right? And I've actually, you know, there's only so many times that you can ask why without really upsetting someone or annoying them. So I've developed some go-to questions over the years that helped me to silence that inner imposter and just be open about it and say, well, can, can you talk me through that? I'm not sure I understand. Can you just explain that to me? Or can I just clarify? Very simple things like this, right? And it really helps because every time you think that this kind of, you know, super smart engineer will look down on you, they won't because you're just asking a genuine question and they're more than happy to talk you through. Um, the other key thing is, again, I have to do it in local language because I really want it to resonate because it's such a key thing for me, is being able to say, ich weiß es nicht. Just saying, I don't know. Again, that whole feeling of, shit, I need to have all the answers. I need to be this fountain of knowledge. Forget about it, seriously. I live in a country that is ruled by someone who does that all the time. He'll say, I don't know, but let me go and find out or let me at least have another referendum or another election, whatever, right? Really powerful, just being able to say, I don't know, and just accept that, and then say, well, let me find out, or let me come back to you, really important. When you're feeling like a fraud, being able to ask why, ask those questions, and being able to say, I don't know, let me find out. Overload, who feels overloaded at times? Show of hands. See, that's what I expected, because I get that a lot when I feel there's just too much going on, too many requests, meetings, not great fan of meetings, Lots of um, stuff that we need to do, no time to think and reflect like we talked about earlier. And I learned very early on in my career that focus is about saying no. There was only one problem with that, is that the way I used to say no wasn't particularly constructive or helpful. It didn't really help me to build relationships with the people I was working with. Again, I told you I'm from the Netherlands, right? So it would look a bit like this, where a staker will have come to me and say, Mark, can we build that feature? Can we do that request? And I'd be like, uh, no. And the staker would say, I'm not sure what you mean by no. And, and I'd be like, what is it about no that you don't understand, right? Didn't last very long, right? So final technique I want to share with you today is different ways of saying no in a slightly more sustainable and constructive manner. Start small. We'll talk about considering side effects, providing options, and being very transparent about kind of any ruthless prioritization decisions that you make, right? Starting small, really helpful. I work with a lot of people that typically come to me, if we have to talk about cake, they'll ask me straight for the wedding cake, right? And instead of saying, fuck no, we're not gonna do a wedding cake, I'm saying, well, let's start with the cupcake first, and then we see if we can eventually create a wedding cake. But it really helps, so instead of saying no, and a full no, you break it down. Equally, 
I get a lot of people saying, well, surely, can you, can you do that small thing? Must be easy to do, right? It's like, yeah, surely that can't be that hard to fix that particular bug or create that feature. As a, as a product person, I'm in a good position to say, well, to you that might seem like a small thing, but have you considered any negative impacts on the user experience? The maintenance costs once we do this, or the cost to delay, or the opportunity cost. So again, getting people to think about the side effects before committing to doing a small piece of work. Providing options. Again, make it very transparent to say, well, we can do that, but this has to suffer, or the cost of delay will be this. Right? And then even better, you make a recommendation to say, I don't think we should be going for option A, we should go for option B. And being transparent about that. Again, it makes it much easier when you do get into a situation where people ask you for more things or ask you for trade-offs, that you've documented it. So I find it really helpful, as a simple example, to have a, a publicly accessible decision log where you, know, you can share quite openly across the company and outside of it what you've decided, who made the decisions, and why. Not only is that helpful for when you have those tough conversations about and where you have to say no, it also gives you a bit of an audit trail as well. So, focus is absolutely key if you want to feel overloaded. Being able to say no in, in some smarter ways than I initially did in my career, and being able to be, you know, just be very transparent about that. So if you do all those things, even though I said this wouldn't be a self-help session, I do believe you'll get to my favorite emotion, which is happiness, right? We learned how to manage conflict. We know how to take a helicopter view. We can accept radically, we can silence our inner frauds, and we're able to say no in a constructive manner, right? But, there's always a but with these kind of things, right? Managing your frustrations, particularly when developing products, is not a one-off exercise. You know, it's something that you have to keep doing over and over again, and allowing yourself to try and learn and really reflect on things. If one of these techniques, and you think, oh, that's quite interesting, you try out when you go to work tomorrow or on Monday, and it doesn't work, try something else, right? The key thing, I think, is whatever happens, just take the step out of that moment, step in that helicopter, pause early and often, right? And just to help you get started, here are some books that you might find helpful to think a bit more about some of the things that we touched on in the talk today, right? So even when you do all these things, you know, you look at some of the techniques, you've got right intentions, say, I know what my frustrations are, I'm gonna tackle them, Mark has given me some books, I'm gonna read them all. It will still keep happening. You will get frustrated every now and then because that's all part of the beautiful craft that is developing products. Thank you very much.